Well, good evening and a happy Sabbath and welcome to the Friday night study. So um, we're going to continue looking at Jones, uh, an appeal for evangelical Christianity. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and for the time that we have to look at this history of our church and uh, the history of Jones and the things that he taught and his relationship to the church as we ponder and consider our relationship to the church and to the movement. We just pray, Lord, that um, you can instruct us through your spirit. And we pray that you can be with each person who is studying. We ask that um, your Holy Spirit can make an impression upon our hearts and minds that the things that we study will be clearly understood. And we pray uh, for those around us that we minister to and our family and friends. And we ask, Lord, for your care and protection for each person. Be with us now as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again. A couple of people came on. One disappeared. Oh, no, both there. So two more people came on since I started the prayer. And it's nice to see all of you um, here for these studies on Friday evening. We've been going through A.T. Jones' appeal for evangelical Christianity. Now, personally, I can't find anything wrong with what he's saying. So Jones is not, as far as I can tell, everything that Jones wrote is solid. But he had a problem with the church, or the church had a problem with him, and you know, he calls them out on it. Whether he should have done that or not, I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not there. I don't know all of the situation, all of the things involved. Personally, I wouldn't do it. You know, it's like the church has done lots of things that I don't agree with, and I don't call them out on it. And, and even within the movement, there's a lot of things that I've seen through the years that I didn't agree with. I never... I never called them out on it or spoke against it, especially against individuals. Now, sometimes you have to present what you understand as you're studying, but I, I don't believe that that the message is benefited by being embroiled in controversy. We, we think in our human nature, you know, like if I could, you know, straighten them out if they would listen. But but in, in my experience, it, it doesn't really work that when people are in error, there's not much you can say. There are things you can do. That is, you can act as a Christian. You can be kind to them no matter how they treat you. But calling them out for their actions doesn't appear to work too well. And, and I have done it. I mean, there's times I've called people out for their actions and, and, and for what they're teaching or saying. And I haven't found that it's, it's ever helped that person. Now, we could say, well, we need to present the truth because it might help other people. And, you know, that, that is a plausible point. I mean, there are things uh, that we definitely need to share, but you don't need to necessarily share them in the context of a conflict, right? I mean, you can talk about the principle of organization and what it is without actually addressing specific details. And even though he's not naming people by name per se, I mean, the people know who they are. You know, obviously he, the general conference president is the general conference president. Everybody's going to know who that is. So that would be the only thing that I have a problem with. I guess if you want to say I have a problem with it is what he's saying is correct. I agree with him regarding organization. That is, I believe that organization organization is, well, I have a saying, which I know is unique to me. I've, I've looked it on the internet. Nobody said anything similar, but unity is an individual work. And that would go for organization as well. And, and why would I say unity is an individual work? Because we need to be united with Christ. And if we are united with Christ, those that are united with Christ will be united with us, right? Not that I'm, you know, forcing other people to be united with me. I may not even know the other person who I'm united with. But God can take 
two people who are united with him and and their actions can be coordinated through the Holy Spirit to accomplish a work. You know, one man can, you know, can plow, one man can sow, one man can water, one man can weed, and they may never ever meet, right? So somebody plants a seed and somebody else comes along and, and when that seed is, has begun to grow and, you know, he, he weeds, right? Maybe waters. And, and then somebody else comes along and harvests. And, and so if we believe in the Holy Spirit, the ability of the Holy Spirit to work upon the heart of the individual, if we believe that God is our head, then we should be able to have faith in what God is doing, even if we can't see it. Right. And there's lots of things that God is doing that we have no idea what he's doing behind the scenes. So to me, it's important that we we trust God to take care of the problems that we perceive. And that is, I may be wrong in what I perceive about another person. Actually, most likely I am wrong. Now, why are we usually wrong when we when I say we are wrong, when we perceive something about another person that we're most likely wrong? Is that true? Do you guys agree with me? If I judge by appearances, okay, yes. So Kelly says, especially when we can't see God's hand. So the one thing about unity is I may not, I may be united with somebody that that they're doing a work that God has asked them to do, and it's not the work that God asked me to do. And I may look at what they're doing and not understand the purposes of why God has told a person to do a certain thing. So this is part of the problem that Jones was dealing with, and it was part of the problem that was happening in the organized work. Yeah. So one is we tend to see, if we're looking at faults, we're going to see the faults in others that are probably things that are in ourselves. But but we also know that God hasn't told me what another person should do, right? I mean, if I believe in the individuality of my own actions and, and somebody comes along and says, well, you know, I, I don't think you're doing the right thing. Well, I, I need to, to recognize that I am doing the right thing. He may not understand it or she may not understand what I'm doing. And, and the same would go for me looking at what they're doing. I may not understand. I may not see what God's purposes are. Now, obviously, we're not talking about open sin and rebellion. You know, we're just we're talking about a person doing a work. And we're all different. We all have different gifts and abilities. You know, sometimes we think we know how things should be done. But God can tell us for us. Now, when it comes to managing others, that is, in the situation where we work together in a more openly organized way there is a tendency of man to try to shape the work after his own ideas right Ellen White talks about this all the time and to be able to work with others but to trust when somebody believes that they need to do a certain thing to not have to constantly get permission uh, to do that thing to go the way that they feel that God is leading them um, I have to give people that same freedom that I would want for myself. And that's sometimes hard to do, right? So it's easy to ask for freedom, but to actually allow that freedom in another individual, that, that's a bit more difficult. But working with others requires it. It is, there's definitely, when I work with others, they're not always going to see things the way that I see them. And, and I can guarantee that just because I see things a certain way, uh, it doesn't mean that it's right for them. So, I mean, I can counsel with somebody. They can listen to my counsel, but they have to decide for themselves. And and I listen to other people's counsel, but I have to decide, is their counsel, counsel valid or not? And sometimes it's done in love, in kindness, but it's, it's wrong, right? I've had people counsel me in things and they weren't correct. That is, they couldn't see exactly everything that God could see. And often I've acted in faith when I couldn't even see what God's purposes were. 
All I knew is what God was asking me to do. And sometimes people will say, well, can you explain your actions? And I could say, well, not really, because I'm just doing what God asked me to do. Not what I want to do may not be what I want to do at all, but I may be compelled through the Holy Spirit to do things that sometimes don't make sense to me. And so that the fact that they don't make sense to someone else who's not me isn't surprising in that case. So when it comes to this organized work, we can see that the Jones is opposed to what is happening in the organized work, what they call organized. But I'm not so sure that, you know, Jones is completely in the right and how he's seeing the problem. That is, he may be correct in what he's saying, but he may not necessarily know the hearts of others. So there is a place for organized work that isn't, you know, it isn't what I would do, but God still uses it. But anyway, we're going to go through and read this. So he's saying that this is not Protestant in truth, the way that they are organized. Uh, this professed organized work is not only is not only not mosaic. So he's got a not only not mosaic in truth. That is, it's not really mosaic, right? It's the double negative. It is not Protestant in truth. The first, the first of all Protestant principles is the right of private judgment in religion and thus perfect, perfect individuality in religion. But this first of all Protestant principle is neither recognized nor allowed in the Seventh day Adventist organized work. The principle is recognized as relates to the state, but it is not allowed at all as it relates to the church, nor is it allowed in the SDA denomination. The organized work, in quotation marks, will spend much time and effort and money and will travel long distances to many places to maintain and defend the full and perfect right of every individual to believe for himself without, without any dictation or interference by the state. And all of this is perfectly right. Uh, but this is not Protestant in truth. This Protestant principle, right, because it has to do with the church. That's what we mean. This Protestant principle as such applies first of all to the church. It must never be forgotten that this principle, as originally espoused, primarily had no reference whatever to the state, but only to the church and its organized work. Secondarily, it related to the state, because the state was only the tool of the church, and when by the Constitution of the United States, church and state became separated, the principle applies, of course, equally to the state as to the church. But primarily and through all Protestant history, the principle applies to the church. And now for Seventh-day Adventists or anybody else to confine it exclusively or even primarily to the state and deny it as to the church is a total perversion of it and exactly repeats the same perverse course of every denomination before. Now, when we think about this, I mean, we know that errors come in, right? There are going to be people who are going to be teaching things that are contrary uh, to the gospel. But this is not primarily about teaching as much as working, right? So as an individual, the church can't tell me what to do. Now, they can tell their ministers what to do. That is, I mean, if you think about it, the church is an organization, it has employees, and it can put some restrictions upon its employees, right? And that's where I would think that the church has a right to hire or fire ministers, to take away a minister's credentials. I mean, they do. doesn't mean that they're that it's just because they have the right to do it that they should do it, because there's other things that they should do before taking away a minister's credentials, such as they did with A.T. Jones. That is, they didn't really follow, because they were just trying to get rid of him. They just saw him as a troublemaker. Let's just take away his credentials. So that, so they definitely didn't act in the correct way, from what I understand, from what Jones has presented. So, so the church does have some responsibility in that regard. But we see that the church overreaches 
even to the individual members, right? So, I mean, if the church tells me that I can't uh, study something and share it on the internet, that I can't talk about it to my friends, the church has overstepped its bounds, even in the area of doctrine, right? And, and Kelly knows about this personally when it comes to what happened to him in, in regard to the 2520. So, Kelly, are you able to yeah. share a little bit about what happened with the church and, and what yeah. the Canadian Union said and and how that sort of yeah. happened? Yeah, it, it, uh, it was trial by midnight, um, <laughs> church of 1,600 membership, uh, 600 attending on a Sabbath, the average church business meeting would have over a hundred people. Mm-hmm. So when they called this yeah. business meeting to deal with, deal with me, there were 33, I think 33 people. And of course, now, they were all now, even before that, but even before that, just from rumors and gossip, they forbid you to, to share right. even before this fellowship. Right. The, uh, the head pastor, there's th- there were three of them. Uh, he, in between morning Sabbath school and church service, they have announcements, and he stood on. He stood there at, at the head of the church and announcing to everybody that there were a couple of people. There was me and Peter, maybe that's all. Anyway, a couple of people talking about this twenty five twenty. And that they had forbidden them to talk about it on social media or email or or in person, and that if anyone did was contacted by them, they were to tell the leadership and they would deal with the person. So at that point, Peter and I, I was a Sabbath school teacher and a deacon. At that point, I was not sharing it uh, rampantly. It, it, it would come up in topic of interest and relate it to it, but I didn't teach it. Per se. Well, well, you weren't even really convinced on it yet. Well, I didn't know it well enough to defend it fully, but I was convinced. Yeah, it was of, just something you were looking at. Right. No, I, at that point, I was convinced. I was, I, I was, you know, printing my own charts and sharing them and so on. But uh, even at, the at that point, point, I hadn't shared it, shared it that much in in church with pe- people I knew. Even hadn't yeah. shared it that much. But the pastor stands up in front of the whole congregation and and educates them on the twenty five twenty. Next thing we know is everyone's looking at each other. Well, what's this twenty five twenty? And they start looking into it, and it, it had it was like God took it in His hands. Yeah. You know, I never would have been able to stand up in front of the church and talk about the twenty five twenty, and then and then at this fellowship meeting, which was was what it was really, um, I asked for a, you know a secret vote so that everybody could vote according to their conscience without pressure. They agreed to that. And it was still 30, 30 to 33 vote, which is uh, fine. I accepted that. I pretty much counted on it being something like that. And I just said to the people before the vote, you don't have to do this. And the pastor said, no, we do have to do this. Uh, and uh, what was it? Uh, I said, well, if you, if you vote to disfellowship me, I'll still keep coming to church. And, and whatever I mean, it's, I'll still be here. And one yeah, of the did, members yeah, they, stood up and said, oh, "Pastor, what church? if he keeps coming? Yeah, Pastor, so what if he keeps keep... coming and talking about that stuff?" And the part, pastor says, "Well, we hope he won't, but basically, we've unshackled Kelly." And the words were like, "Wow, I was shackled." He <laughs> used that term, so yeah. Now it I'll... was just a. There's so many things in that experience that. Mm-hmm. So we're to, wrong. To, to, to and I, and I just points, basically quoted a Luther here, points, and Kelly, I can do no more. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Just a couple of points. Yeah. So um, now, as far as the them, did they did they censure you first? No, no. Uh, I've been called to an elders meeting and to present my stuff. Well, I sat in the lobby in the past. The associate pastor ran in and out three times. I sat in the lobby for twenty minutes while he photocopied material. To educate the elders on the twenty five twenty, how did they skip that? How did they skip that? 
that step of censorship first? I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. I, uh, okay. I didn't care that much about it, so I didn't follow it that close. And, like, do what you want. I'm stubborn me, but I asked for a letter explaining it or something, which I didn't get. And, mm-hmm. You know. Now, now the, you talked to the Canadian Union as well about it. Uh, no, I don't no. remember talking well, to people, the Canadian People in the Canadian Union, people that you knew, like, yeah, because you told me that they, they told you they can't really tell you that you can't share on the internet or something like that. Like, um, yeah, I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, talking to anyone in the in the conference or the union, okay. I don't remember it. It'll maybe come back to me, but uh, no. Um, I think one of the things that really got the associate pastor that was leading the battle against me was uh, or the 2520 was. Uh, mm-hmm that I had recorded it and he had talked about the Alberta conference and showed a letter on the screen that this 2520 needed to be dealt with. So this was coming from headquarters and yeah. not the church. It was, a, it was an agenda of the conference. So yeah. the same in BC, it's, it's really worse in BC. Well, and I know they tried to get the, my pastor to deal with me in Warburg, but um, there's no way that the church would have ever disfellowshipped me, you know, so, so, and so he didn't get so much. Neat, well, the Warburg church is your, basically the Turner church there. <laughs> well, yeah. Largely. And, the Turner, to, and the Molyneux. And, most of the people. <laughs> related, related to most of them, but no, the, yeah. the things that, that, that assured me that I was on the right course in some way was the things that God showed me, like praying before driving to church one morning and and seeing that license plate on the car, the Jeff. So I was praying, should I follow yeah. Parmender's ideas or Jeff's? And I see this car with a license plate number in Calgary, a million people, the Jeff, <laughs> on the way to church just after praying about it. And then when they this fellowship, me and I go to camp meeting the next week, and there there's Rudy Harnish holding up the pioneer charts teaching pioneer history. And I'm like, they're on the, the camp meeting grounds and they just told me I can't show these. <laughs> so, you know, I had so many things witnessed to me that God was, yeah. had my back on this. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it definitely did help that the church acted that way as far as more of your resolve. And the important right. thing is, is uh, I wasn't, wasn't angry, bitter, or upset or discouraged by it at all. But, I just know that I was grounded in Seventh Day Adventist understanding of the Bible, and I wasn't mm-hmm. going anywhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that, Kelly. So, so we can see that that there is. Uh, I asked if I'm still a member of of that church. I'm I'm still a member in Warburg. I don't think. Uh, there's any plans to disfellowship me? I don't know. My pastor's going to come see me next Friday. He wants to see me before I go to Australia. Maybe you know. Well, maybe that's what he wants to talk about. I doubt it though. But uh, could be something else. Maybe he just wants to encourage me. Um, he's a pretty good pastor. The pastor I have now. Yeah, I never really worry about it. When I became an Adventist, I, I wasn't didn't really want to become a Seventh Day Adventist. I wanted to get baptized. And they just said, well, when you get baptized, you, you automatically become a member of the church. And I said, okay, well, it doesn't matter to me, I guess. But uh, I've never really cared about church membership. But, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of an individualistic-minded person. And um, and I, I don't usually, you know, play well with others generally. So, obviously, I've had to learn that as a Christian, that the importance of working with others. And and that's part of the, the thing that we're discussing here in organization. So when the church is organized and, and we decide to cooperate with others, it, it does require a development of character in dealing with others. Even people who are converted, just because the other person is converted. One is I may not be. Right. So so there may be things in me that really need to change. I may have defects in my character that I'm not aware of. So I think it's extremely important to be able to cooperate with others and and to um, submit to authority 
even though it's not something I've ever liked. You know, I'm not necessarily good at it like by nature. But as a Christian, I can trust that God is in control. And so whether that authority is just or unjust, I can submit, I can take it as submitting to God because whatever happens comes from God first. And, and that's where I would have a difference, I guess, with Jones is in how he is addressing this problem. It's not something I don't think I would do, but I don't think what he's saying is wrong. Okay, so he goes on. Um, Therefore, when the Seventh-day Adventist denomination and organized work apply this first of all Protestant principles to the state as they do, and then refuse it as to the church as they do, it is absolutely inconsistent in itself and unProtestant as to the principle. It is not fairly Protestant to protest against Rome and then follow Rome's very course. It is not fairly Protestant to protest even against false Protestantism only in some things while repeating other things that are just as falsely Protestant and more Romish. For who ever heard of any other professed Protestants teaching that in Peter, believers were united in the Holy Ghost? Further, you maintain that when the state holds strictly, so um, yeah, Kelly has a comment there, um, Further, you maintain that when the state holds strictly <coughs> to this principle of perfect freedom of conscience and individuality in religion, that is according to Christian principle, but you will not allow that your own church shall hold this attitude, which you insist that the state must hold. In this, then, you require that the state shall be more Christian than your own church. Any abridgment or interference, whatever, with this full and perfect right of the individual by the state, the Seventh-day Adventist organized work will vigorously deny over yonder on Capitol Hill. But you positively affirm it for your own church over here on Tacoma Park Hill. You insist that your church shall hold and exercise this very power that you deny to the state. Then it is certain that, as the Seventh-day Adventist organized work stands, all of the people are better off only as citizens of the United States than they would be as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. For so long as they are only citizens of the United States, your organized work will spend time and money and energy strongly and continuously to maintain their perfect right in the exercise of private judgment and their own individuality and religion. But the moment they become members of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, that right is absolutely denied. And if they attempt to exercise it, then the organized work will spend time and money and energy in vigorously denying the right and denouncing them and casting them out, even without any notice or hearing. So when Kelly was talking about being unshackled, right, he was unshackled to be just a regular Canadian, um, but he was shackled when he was a Seventh-day Adventist member. And all this as to this Protestant principle is witnessed by your own acknowledged authoritative writings. In the Great Controversy, page 292 to 293, there's mentioned that grand principle, the outgrowth of the New Testament, which acknowledges God as the sole judge of human faith. And then there follow these weighty and most pertinent words. The doctrine that God has committed to the church the right to control the conscience and to define and punish heresy is one of the most deeply rooted of papal errors. Is that papal error so deeply rooted in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination and organized work that it cannot be rooted up? Is it so deeply rooted there that it must remain and grow into another great papal tree of religious despotism in the church? Even if this be so, there must not be forgotten the divine word that every plant that my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. My brethren, far better will it be to allow that papal error to be rooted up now by the gentle grace of the Holy Spirit than to refuse this now and then have it rooted up by the awful hand of the almighty God in the great and hastening day. Oh, choose now to have it rooted up 
now. I don't know if anybody has any problems with what Jones is saying. I personally don't. Because, you know, as we say, it, it, it's being connected to Christ and that we should be able to trust even when people have false ideas. Now, in Warburg Church, <clears throat> our church is famous for taking in people that other churches uh, didn't want. So a lot of people ended up in Warburg who were uh, persona non grata at uh, other churches in the province. And the way that we dealt with people was they had some special little soapbox, you know, idea that they wanted to present, present it. Nobody was threatened by it. You know, we had people, you know, the na name of God, character of God, people, lots of different different views. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. We would just listen to what they had to say. And you now what would happen is sometimes those people, they ended up becoming just good, solid members in the church. And those little ideas they had just went by the way over time. But sometimes some of those individuals want to be opposed. And so when they're not opposed, they go someplace where they are opposed. So there are people who have errors um, and they have those errors just sheerly out of human pride. And if you oppose them, you're actually doing exactly what they want. So we've never found that it, it was useful to censure people and punish people because of their beliefs. Just allow them to believe what they believe. And even if they want to present it, if they're going to present their ideas in Sabbath school, we, we had people doing all kinds of sermons in Warburg when I was first there. Uh, one is our pastor never showed up. But people would also speak out if somebody was teaching error. So nobody felt that just because somebody was presenting from the pulpit that they had to be orthodox and approved in every sort of detail. But we would sometimes have to labor with people if they were presenting things that were in error. Or we may just, I mean, because we have mostly the people who spoke error in our church would be uh, pastors who came in to speak. Um, and often me and a few other people, we would, if a pastor was a, a minister came to speak and he said something that was in error, we would just stand up and correct him right there, which, uh, not all, all pastors liked, but we, we have had some speakers in Warburg Church that actually appreciated that we did that, that we corrected them right on the spot. So just because somebody's teaching error, what you do is you present the truth, but you don't have to attack the person as an individual. Okay, now Jones is going to go on about church federation. This is the next section. The organized work of Seventh-day Adventists is now, as it now stands, can never oppose on principle, nor by the scripture, the now great and sweeping movement of church federation for the Seventh-day Adventist organization is more of a federation and confederation now than that other will be five years from now. So he's talking about this, this Christian faith, church federation movement, and he's just saying that they're in line with it. No Seventh-day Adventist of the organized work can ever oppose church federation on principle and as it now is without exposing the same thing in your own federation. And this is confirmed by the report of the Proceedings of the Religious Liberty Department, 10th meeting, May 25th at 8 a.m. This report says that Professor W.W. W. Prescott occupied the first half hour of the meeting with an address on the subject of the Interchurch Federation Movement and our relation to it. So what they're talking about is what we would call, what, what do we call that now? Christian coalition or something like that? No, no, no. No, it's not the Christian. It's where churches cooperate with other churches. Like our pastors, they go into meetings and meet with pastors from other denominations. Well, council, council of churches, council of churches. No. World council of churches. No. 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 We're talking about on a local level, interchurch federation movement. That would be, uh, I just can't remember what we call it. Okay. No, yeah. It's not ecumenism. What I'm talking about is when our pastors, they meet with other pastors, like on a local church level, a pastor's association. Yeah. So, so I think that's what they're talking about, but you know, they could be talking about it on a bigger level, but, but I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what the interchurch federation movement is, 
But anyway, so uh, in this report that W.W. Prescott presents, he says the Catholic Church uh, needed no such movement for they were already federated. Uh, Now, the Catholic Church is a single church with only a single organization of its own self and its own work alone, separate from all, all the other churches. Therefore, as certainly as the Catholic Church is a federation, then just so, certainly the Seventh-day Adventist Church, being only a single church itself and its own work organized as a single organization, separate from all other churches, is likewise a federation. It is simply impossible to count the Catholic Church as a federation and logically escape counting the Seventh-day Adventist Church equally as a federation. It is the truth. The Catholic Church is a federation, and so is every other church that is organized on the plan or the pr- on the principle of the Catholic Church. If any of you do not believe that you oppose church federation on principle, will only expose your own federation, then just try it and see how soon you will find that your attitude is antagonistic to the organized work. And in this, you need not mention or even refer to the Seventh-day Adventists or their organized work. Yet to oppose and expose on principle and by the scriptures that great movement of church federation is the very third angel's message, as that message is now due in warning against the beast and his image. As for me, I will preach this message. Okay, so Jones is going to have a conclusion here. Uh, Finally, I have not appealed for any redress or grievance. So, So he says he's not doing this to get them to change their minds necessarily but he wants to present the truth. And and that could be true. For I have not been aggrieved. I have not appealed for any reinstatement. For I have not been displaced. I have not appealed for any return of credential. For no true credential was taken away. All that was taken away was but a piece of paper. And I have not appealed for the reversal of any action in my favor, nor for the taking of any action in my favor. I have appealed only in behalf of justice, of Christian right and of Christian truth. I've not been injured at all. It is you, this general conference in session. It is the organized work of the denomination. It is the denomination itself that is concerned far more than I or anything relating to me. I know that this general conference, that the organized work of the denomination, that the denomination itself, all these stand face to face with questions and are involved in matters that demand sober thinking prayerful consideration, and open and thorough investigation. You cannot afford to treat these things lightly, nor slightly, slightingly, much less can you afford to treat them cavalierly or contemptuously. And now in closing, I do not know how that I can close this address any better than in some of the words in which I replied June 21st, 1907, to the General Conference Committee when I received the statement of the action which they had taken at Glans, Switzerland, when they took away his credentials. My dear brethren, there is no kind need nor any call for you folks at Glans, Switzerland or anywhere else to go through all that extended statement, recommendation, protest, and committee official formulary formulary to to secure the return of the credential referred to All in the world that was ever needed for that was a simple statement or suggestion or even a hint to the effect, and the credential would have been promptly returned, and that would have been the end of the matter so far as I have been concerned. By the way, while I was writing the foregoing paragraph, the review in June 20 came to my hand in which I read the statement of Brother Fant, late priest of the Roman Church, that by that church he was rebuked for liberal tendencies and was cast out. Now, my friends and brethren of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, did the Roman Church do right in that? Of course, you will have to say yes, because what you have done with me is in kind just that. Now, this reminds me of something. Um, we had a, um, a conference from the Alberta Conference, an official. I think he was... I think he was a treasurer. I'm not sure what his position was, come to think of it. Anyway, he was he was a fairly young man, so I don't know. But anyway, he came to our house for Sabbath dinner after he preached in our church. We had a discussion. I remember my son Joe was there. Joe would have been a teenager, and uh, he always listened to all the adult discussions. He got involved. He had strong opinions. 
Um, but anyway, this 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 uh, minister was uh, talking about the idea that the Roman Catholic Church was correct in how it dealt with heresy. The only problem was that they were wrong in what they considered heresy to be. Basically, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he was saying. Now, my son Joe was just totally incensed. I mean, he just could not believe that, you know, this conference official could believe that the Catholic Church was right in how it dealt with people that were teaching what they believed to be error. But this is this is the position of the church, really, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with disfellowshipping people in this way and trying to control them. Uh, the only problem is what you believe. Right. And, and that's not true. The problem is the Catholic Church and how they deal with heresy. What they consider to be heresy. It's not that they're right or wrong in what they believe. OK, so <clears throat> anyway, it just reminded me of that. But I say that the Roman church did utterly wrong in that, just as I say that you have done utterly wrong in this. I say that the Roman church should have listened respectfully to what Brother Fant had to say and should have considered carefully all that he had to present and should have diligently compared it all with the scriptures and with the facts, candidly inquiring for just what is the truth and the right of the matter and asking the Holy Spirit to guide them all into the pure pure truth of the word of God and the pure truth of the facts, all holding themselves ready to take the way of the pure truth as soon as it should be made to appear from the scriptures and the facts. And that is what the Roman church ought to have done with Brother Fant. And that is what it ought to have done with me. But for the Roman church to have done that with Brother Fant would have been the ruination of her whole system. And Rome knows it. Now, brethren, why didn't you do that way with me? The ruination of the whole Roman system accomplished in that way would be the best thing that could ever happen either to Rome or to the world. But Rome would think that to do so would be only to court anarchy and ruin of every kind to the whole universe. Yet in all this, Rome utterly mistakes and is wrong. My brethren, why do you take a course that justifies Rome in her course in all that blind and wrong way? And why do you not do with me as Rome ought to have done with Brother Fant? Now, please do not think that I am pleading for myself in this. I am pleading only for the truth and for the true principle and much more. Please do not think that I am in any sense pleading for the retention of general conference credentials. You are perfectly welcome to do this for which you have asked. On general principles, I care nothing for such credentials and never had a care for them. I preached the third angel's message a good while, not only before I ever had any such credentials, but when the general conference committee actually refused me even the recognition of a license. And I shall continue to preach that message now that the General Conference Committee refuses me of the recognition of a credential. I was without any such credentials for a whole year before this, that you have recalled was given. And what I mean by any such credentials is that for a whole year preceding 1905, I had no credentials either from the General Conference or any state conference, nor from uh, any other earthly source. Being without any such credentials for a year before 1905, I never asked for this one that you have recalled and never would have asked for it, nor for any other of a like nature. Your protest is in view of the fact that I, during that time, retained the ministerial credentials, etc. Why shouldn't I? I had received no intimation that I should not retain it, and I have not had any wish and have not now um, to separate from my, myself from my brethren in the ministry or from the denomination. However, it is only proper for me to say here that I have said in general conf what I have said in general conference assemblies and other places many times that I never did and never will ask what the denomination believes or does or has believed or has done. All that I have ever asked or shall ask is what does the word of God call me and the denomination to to believe and what by that word is the thing for me and the denomination too, to do. So far as lies in your power, 
you have by this action taken separated me from the denomination. By this action, you have renounced all denominational relationship to me as a minister of the gospel. So far as you are concerned, by this action, you have made my position in relationship to the denomination as a minister of the gospel, the same as that of any Baptist or Methodist minister. And I'm not resenting this, nor am I just now going to contest your action, though you had no kind of right to take the action that you did take. But I do ask and have the right to ask, are you now going to allow me to preach the message that I have to preach without any molestation or any denunciation of me from yourselves and the denomination as you allow Baptist and Methodist ministers to preach the message that they have to preach without molesting or denouncing them? If not, why not? You have no cause to do otherwise, for I told you more than a year ago that I have no disposition to oppose what you are doing in any other way than by preaching the gospel. That is true now, and all that I shall preach will be simply the gospel as it is in the third angel's message today and as the days go by. <clears throat> Yet by the action in the very wording of the action which you have taken so far as lies in your power to have separated me from all connection with the denomination as a minister, in this so far as lies in your power, you have freed me from all responsibility to or for the denomination as a minister and I have and have placed the SDA denomination in the same position precisely as that of all the other denominations. I have a message to all the other denominations. Yes, a message to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. It is the third angel's message. I've heretofore had a message to all the other denominations. I have that message yet, and I'm giving it to them. And now that you have put the Seventh-day Adventist uh, denomination in the same position precisely, toward me as the other denominations have always occupied toward us, it certainly follows that now my message will be to the Seventh-day Adventists equally with all the other denominations. Therefore, will you allow me unmolested and undenounced to preach this message to those of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination who may wish to hear it, as I'm allowed unmolested and undenounced to preach it to those of the other denominations and to all people? Or will you tell the people of the denomination not even to hear the message when I preach it? Just as ministers of all the other denominations tell the people of their denominations, when you and the other ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination go preaching. And if you do, do thus toward me, then do not the ministers of the other denominations do just right when they do thus toward you? and the other ministers and people of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. If I ought not to be heard when I preach the message, then is it not exactly right that you should not be heard when you preach it? And if nobody should believe the message when I preach it, then isn't it right that nobody should believe the message when you preach it? Or do you expect me to stop preaching the third angel's message just because you have recalled the credential that the General Conference gave. Why should you expect that I would stop preaching this message when you recall the credential which the General Con Conference gave when I preached the message a long while before I was ever given any general or other conference credential, and when the General Conference Committee refused me even the recognition, recognition of a license? I received this message and credential and commission to preach it before I had any recognition from the denomination. I preached this message with true credentials long before the denomination gave me any credentials and when the General Conference Committee refused any license or other recognition. And now that the General Conference has reached the same point again, this makes no more difference to me than it did before. I hold no resentment nor ill will in any way toward them then, then and I hold none toward you now. I go right on preaching the message just as I did at the first and with the same spirit of peace on earth, goodwill to men as at the first. Nearly, if not quite, two years ago, I told those at the General Conference headquarters that I would not seek to preach to Seventh-day Adventists as such and would refuse to preach in Seventh-day Adventist meeting houses. I've acted consistently with that word all this time. 
The only places where I've preached in their meeting houses was in five places only. And that only because further refusal would have done more harm than to not do it. But now I say to you all that I will not refuse anymore. I will not ask that I may, and I will not ask or direct any others to ask this for me. But when the people themselves ask that I come there, I will do it as readily as anywhere else. The gospel that I preach is to all, and all men have it freely who want it. And that Seventh-day Adventist who wants to hear it have the privilege equally with all others. And why shouldn't they hear it equally with all others? By the words of the one who is now your president, his own words spoken in London, England on May 1902, it is right. By your own acknowledged authoritative writings, it is right. By the truth of history, it is right. By truest Protestant authority, it is right. By fundamental Protestant principle, it is right. By the scriptures of truth, it is right. By the Christian order, as in the New Testament, it is right. By the very existence of Christianity as a separate religion, it is right. It is right, eternally right. Therefore, it ought to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, and it will prevail. Now, brethren, farewell, and the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. If we're going to address the situation with Jones, we can see it's, it's a, a deep contrast from what happened with Wagner. So Wagner had rejected the Seventh-day Adventist message, the three angels' messages, the sanctuary, the investigative judgment. Jones had not. Now, I have tried to find where Ellen White condemns Jones in this regard. Now, I have not been able to find the statements that people have sometimes attributed to Ellen White in regard to Jones. I, I haven't been able to find it. Doesn't mean that there isn't something that she says about Jones uh, that I don't know about, but I haven't been able to find it. So. So some of these things are just rumors and gossip that we've heard about Jones. Maybe some of them are true, but I haven't been able to find this information. She doesn't she refer to them without name, like the two messengers or something about the conference officials would be uh, responsible, personally responsible for their. You know, for their leaving the church. Yeah, but, but that's earlier. What I'm saying is she doesn't say anything oh. about where Jones leaves the, the domination, you know, that it was good or it was bad or anything. I, I haven't been okay. able to find anything that she says about this event. Now, people have right. used quotes by Ellen White addressing Jones, but these are all earlier and they're not, they're, they're taken out of context. So, because Jones did have you know, a, a personality that Ellen White rebuked at times. But she rebuked a lot of people. Definitely a lot harsher than she rebuked Jones. And, and she was giving him more advice. There's one where she says, you know, you need to, like, you're presenting a bowl of fruit, but the, your mannerism sometimes makes it distasteful, right? Like, you know, as, mm. you know, presenting something, but in a way that makes it distasteful instead of inviting. And you know, and so he took those things to heart, right? I mean, he, he when Ellen White rebuked him, he seemed to listen. It's a to lack of, rebuke. lack of, it's a lack of tact and, and diplomacy. Diplomacy and, and tact, diplomacy is helping someone to see things your way and think that it was their own idea. Yeah. In other words, to accept and adopt that way in their heart and mind, not just force them. That's the point. And you're that's you're where he was lacking. <laughs> yeah. And, and, oh, uh, definitely lacking lifelong lessons. Lifelong lessons. Yeah. No, I, I mean, there's lots of times I've done more damage uh, than good. So, and, and I've tried to learn from the counsel that Ellen White gave A.T. Jones and others. You know, in the spirit of prophecy, the testimonies, 
I, I try to apply them to myself rather than, you know, reading the testimonies and trying to apply them. Oh, that applies to that person and that to that person. I say, how does this apply Amen. to me? But, but the one, one thing we know is that, you know, if, if we were, if, if people in this movement to write, were to write about me as an individual, I mean, they could have a lot of negative things to say. Doesn't mean they're correct. And just because there's a lot of negative things said about A.T. Jones doesn't mean that those things are true. So I haven't been able to find in the spirit of prophecy any condemnation of Jones at this time. So, you know, she's not. Uh, but, you know, may, maybe there is some statement, you know, that he's gone too far or whatever. But I don't know of any statement and I haven't been able to find one. So. Now, the one I thing I find yeah, interesting. I can't imagine but, that that she would go that far. Did she ever with anyone like basically leaving the judgment, final judgment in God's hands with the matters with an individual's how far they've gone? P well, perhaps well, Kellogg, she might have. Kellogg and and uh, Canwright and yeah, um, Canwright yeah. and the other guy. It's another guy. Can't think of his name. But yeah, I mean, there are people who departed from the truth. Um, and, and she, she did say some things about Wagner, but, um, but I don't know that she says anything about Jones, but I'm, I'm not saying that she doesn't. I just don't know. Now, one, one thing I want to I'm, bring up. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking that some might take any criticism from Ellen White as, as saying that that person is lost or something. And, they went off into a darkness. Yeah, um, exactly. Does she ever really actually make that call on anyone? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Judas. She she comments about Judas and Thomas Paine. Oh yeah, Thomas yeah, Paine. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. I mean, she says some pretty but harsh any, stuff about some of the conference presidents, but uh, yeah, but not yeah. in terms of. Maybe no, they're returning to the state, yeah. warning them. But yeah, I, I don't think all of her passing judgment. Yeah. Anyway, one last thing I want to just uh, bring up as a, as a, as a point. <clears throat> so one is that we can often be very lenient with people from other denominations, right? But even within the church, there is all kinds of error being taught that never gets addressed by the church, right? All kinds of liberal ideas and, and, and all kinds of heresies. And the church never gets up in arms about it, right? They don't, they don't start disfellowshipping people for not believing in the 2300 days, for instance, or the, or the, 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 or, or the seventh day Adventist gay. Uh, yeah, but, but, but I didn't want to go in that direction, but I'm just seeing like things. That I know, are I know, but this, this, this is where I went in my head. I'm like, yeah. yeah, we don't, we rather, rather than counsel and, and, and rebuke, but what is it? Disciple them. We just go along wherever we can compromise with it. Yeah. That's, yeah. There's so much. So what I'm saying is God's going to fix it. Yeah. Isn't he? God's going to fix it all. Right. For some issues and in other issues, they don't. Right. Other issues, the church is all up in arms and, you know, it's just like the greatest heresy ever. That was the thing that surprised me about the 2520 is I couldn't see what the threat was, why the church was threatened by it. That was the thing that intrigued me the most. It's like. And if we. You know, if we didn't have like something that they could sort of catch on, like 2520, like if it was just, you know, if we talked about the seven times Leviticus 26 or something like that, it wouldn't have been such a catchy thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so they have this yeah. label just seems sensational. Uh, you asked me about the disfellowship. One of, one of the times when I did study with the, the pastor and another elder. Uh, I showed them the line of 1798, 1840, 1844, 1843, 2520, proving the Adventist is God's denominated church. And he said, yeah. that's great. It, that's great. I, I wish I could use it. 
And and another instance was asking someone, okay, so we have 1,260 years of, of papal rule, and the 1,260 years of Roman uh, rule. So what what is how much how much is that? 1,260 and 1,260. And he he was being sincere. He struggled. He said he was like 2,460, uh, 2,600. And he honestly seemed like he just could not say it. Twenty five twenty. It was. You couldn't add it. It would have. Yeah. Well, it's not that he couldn't add. It was like there was a strange thing holding him from being able to add. Because he's a very intelligent man. That's what I mean. Like but it was. Get it out. Yeah, and so, so, so out. to me, it seemed like the point that you're trying to make is there was something. There's something about it that was almost supernatural in the opposition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that, absolutely. That was with the people's minds and the church. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was not rational. It was like, this isn't a threat to the church at all. Like, why? Why are you making such a big deal about it? You know, it. It's I'm like some. Pastor actually, saying he wished he could use it because it was so good. It supports the Church of Prophecy. Yeah. yeah. But but so so I think that you know that was the thing that it actually really impressed me the most was the opposition that the church had to it of what why I saw it was important you know it wasn't just because that the church was opposed to it and this is really I, you know I'm opposed to the church and you know I like something that's sensational it's just that the fact that they oppose something that made no sense to oppose like just ignore it if it's not true no no big deal like people believe all kinds of little things. You know, in studying the scriptures or different interpretations of Revelation or Daniel, they're not a threat to the church. And, and they should have treated the 2520 in exactly the same way. But they couldn't help themselves. So there are ways in which we can understand what is true. That if if the church acted in the correct way, if they trusted God to correct the church, all of these different errors would not be promoted. In, in fact, they would be um, suppressed by the presentation of the truth and by acting in a correct way. But when you oppose error, it actually feeds it when you do it in the way that the church has done, you know, with all, all these different things. Uh, the, the fact that the church is trying to, you know, dis disfellowshipping pastors or removing their credentials for not teaching the doctrine of the Trinity correctly or whatever, you know, these types of things, it just promotes it, you know, whatever you and we can see that the, the best way to deal with error is just to present truth and live truth and practice and to study together and try to understand what is correct. And and so I believe in church organization as revealed in the scripture and as revealed in spirit of prophecy. I just think that we now have a church of a new order and it's it's not acting as the Christian church as a Protestant church. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? And, and I'm not really sure what we're going to do next uh, Friday night, because I haven't thought about it yet. We finished this document. So I'm going to have to figure out how to, to finish off this study. Because um, anyway, we'll go into that uh, more next week. I'm going to talk about basically what's going to happen, because I'm going to be going to Australia for six weeks. So it, it's going to affect a little bit our, how our studies are going to go. Um, but I will be presenting the Friday night study. Um, what's that? Are you doing studies from Australia? Yeah, I'll be doing studies from Australia. But some of the, some of the times might change. And I just haven't figured that out yet. Also, I know. Yeah, so, so I got to figure that, you know, and and, and I, I got to figure it out once I get there. I mean, I'm figuring out before I get there, but once I get there, things may change. They may not work out the way that I, I'm planning. Okay, so. Um, I haven't, what, uh, yeah. uh, I haven't, I haven't, I wonder if anyone else has seen that. I haven't been getting emails from you about the meetings or studies. Don't no, send them all. Really, I wonder if it's something with my, mine or your end. Well, I don't send them all the time. Have you got any ever? Well, oh yeah, but it's been a, over a month or so. I, 
I do appreciate them. They they help remind okay. me of start times and such. Well, well, send send me an email and I'll make sure that you're on my email list. But yeah, I send them not every week because you know it doesn't really change much. But I am going to send one out this week because once we talk about some of these things tomorrow, I'm going to send one because there's going to be some changes. So um, definitely have to send that. I understand reasons for not sending them every week, but also uh, it helped me stay uh, connected, even though I didn't join it for two, three years. I was on a journey. So keep sending them weekly if you if it's not too much trouble. Yeah, it, it's not too much. But sometimes I get busy and it's like, well, nothing's changed. No worries. Okay. Great. Thanks for that, Kelly. Well, let's close with prayer. The dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the fellowship that we can have. We just invite your spirit into our hearts that you can continue to unite us uh, with Christ and with one another. We pray for the needs, the health needs. We know there's many who are sick. Um, you know, Kelly has some health issues that he has to address. And we also have family and friends that um, are suffering in different ways. We ask, Lord, that uh, we can leave these things that we have no control over in your hands and that we can be obedient in the things that you give us to do. Uh, thank you for the truths that have been given to us, that the light that we're allowed to see and help us to walk in that light and to be faithful. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.